Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Digital Integrated Circuits. I'm Dr. Adam Tiemann of the Enix Labs at Bar Ilan University, and today we're going to Lecture 2, which is the manufacturing process. So we're going to start with a process primer. This is a quick introduction to the CMOS process. Okay, and just some motivation behind this, and I have a few cartoons to kind of show this. So we have this lady who's in the Stone Age, and she went to write a note to the milkman, and she came back exhausted because she had to write it in stone. Or this guy who wanted to write a whole book, and it was a bit heavy and took a long time. Um, but something that's even modern nowadays, we have uh, when we want to write a Torah scroll, which is the Jewish uh, Bible. Um, basically, it's written by a rabbi. It has to be handwritten, and uh, he's not allowed to make any mistakes. So it takes uh, between one and three years to write, to write one of these books. Now, that doesn't work for integrated circuits. We have millions, maybe billions of transistors. And as I really like this uh, kind of cartoon that comes out of MIT, um, this guy, he's uh, going and painting uh, these MOSFETs. So he just made one, and he has only 15,432,758 more to go. Well, I don't think he's going to be able to paint all of those. And that's why we have to have our VLSI process. VLSI stands for Very Large scale integration and integrated circuits um, are a process is the, the the actually genius behind the integrated circuits is a process where in one shot i'm able to make many devices and it doesn't matter uh, how uh, how many there are so if i make one device or a thousand devices it'll take me the same time and since it's very large scale integration i'm going to be able to make a, a real lot of these uh, integrated circuits. Actually, we started with what was called LSI, large-scale integration. Then it went to VLSI, very large-scale when it passed a certain number. Then they used to say ULSI, ultra-large-scale, but they figured with Moore's Law continuing and so many more transistors being put on a chip, they'll just stop and call it VLSI forevermore. So the solution to how to do this, uh, a good example from everyday life is the printing process. And Gutenberg came and he had this idea of the printing process where instead of writing out um, like that Torah scroll where it's written out uh, each letter by hand, we'll make some sort of a plate with um, all of the letters set up. And it may take a long time to set this one thing up, but once we have it and we put thousands of letters or whatever on this thing, we just stick it in the machine and push down and we get a page of paper. Now, it takes the same amount of time to print one page of paper, uh, one letter on a page of paper, or a thousand letters on a page of paper, it doesn't matter, and that's what the the genius behind this type of a thing is. Okay, and if we furthermore take the printing process, we can make um, a color picture by. Um, by splitting our whole our final product into several sources. So in the CMYK process uh, of printing, which is cayenne, magenta, yellow, and black, we take four screens of, uh, of uh, color uh, of our image. We just take the blue, the re uh, or the cayenne, the magenta, the yellow, and the black uh, parts of our of our image, and we run um, our page through a print of each of those types of colors. And once we finish, we get the merged content of it, which is the full picture. And that's kind of what we're going to do in our VLSI or in our CMOS process. We're going to take several different layers um, that are se completely separate, and we're going to do them each uh, one at a time. And the final merged product is what we wanted to do. Um, this is kind of what, what we do in the printing process. We take this one page of paper, we stick it through all of these uh, four colors until we finally get our, our uh, page out. But it doesn't matter if our, if our sheet was a, a complex picture or a simple picture. It'll take the same amount of time. It'll always take the time it takes to print these four um, different uh, screens. So how does this basically work? We start with this substrate. Um, it's a piece of silicon, basically. A wafer usually is, is what we deal with. Um, and, um, and that's our substrate. That's the basic on the bottom of our whole thing. Okay, what we're gonna do is often, and this is gonna come back all the time, we're gonna cover our silicon with some sort of a polymer. We call it photoresist. Photoresist. And the reason that it's called photoresist is because it's a type of a material that's um, that, that's sensitive to light okay so when we're going to um, shine light on it it's going to change its qualities usually it, it hardens there are types that um, will soften once we change it so that's why we're going to bring this thing we call a photo mask which is basically a piece of glass that's covered with some chrome material that makes it opaque and the, we want to make some sort of shape 
that's going to be um, imprinted onto our photoresist. So um, what we do is we make a hole in our in our uh, glass over here in in the uh, in the chrome that covers the glass. In this, uh, we want to make an L shape. So we put an L shape on our mask here. Then we take a light. It's not an incandescent light. It's a laser, um, and we shine it and only through the L does the light go through. And as you can see, that created our, the shape that we had uh, above um, was imprinted on our, uh, on our photoresist, or rather that part was either hardened or softened. Then we can develop um, the, the wafer and that washes off basically our photoresist. And all that's left is this L shape, which is now blocking this area. And we can do all kinds of things around um, that won't affect the area underneath it, such as growing some sort of material on here or depositing some sort of material here or uh, maybe making an etch or all kinds of different things that we'll be discussing in this lecture. So just as a reminder, I want to um, show you how the CMOS process or how we make a CMOS transistor. So again, we start with this big substrate. And the substrate is uh, we take an intrinsic uh, silicon wafer. So it's a really nice um, crystal of silicon. We, we give it a small bit of, uh, uh, of P-type uh, um, doping. So we call this the P-sub. And it's a very weak P-type. But usually we start with a P-type. We can also start with an N-type or even an intrinsic wafer. But usually um, it's common to start with a P-type. And what we're going to do is we're going to um, dope uh, a couple of areas here with some um, N plus, okay? So with some really um, a, a lot of electrons, we're gonna uh, we're gonna dope this uh, with, and um, and that's okay. It, it creates a PN junction, and if we look at this here, so we have, and this is very important to remember, we have these two diodes over here that uh, that have um, have uh, been created. Okay. Then what we're gonna do is we're going to um, build some sort of an oxide here some sort of a dielectric, okay? And on top of the dielectric, we're gonna uh, build uh, another um, piece, some sort of other conductor, okay? And this will be the gate of the transistor, and uh, this will be the source and the drain, or the opposite, it doesn't matter. Um, it depends on which side they're on, as we learned in our previous circuits class. Um, so this basically made our transistor. Um, what we have to pay attention, though, is that these diodes, they have to be reverse biased. And how are we going to make them reverse biased? Well, we're going to connect our substrate to ground. If our substrate is connected to ground, and that's the lowest um, uh, voltage that we have in, in the whole um, circuit, and let's say we have a battery or a power source somewhere uh, that's giving us a, a voltage of VDD, we know that our um, our voltage in our circuit is going to usually, normally, only go between zero and VDD, and that means that this um, th this node of the uh, diode will always be at least at zero volts and probably higher, and therefore both this and this diode will be reverse biased. How are we going to reverse bias it? How are we going to give it this uh, voltage? Because we can't just go and connect ground over here. What we have to do is we have to put another doping. Um, this doping is a, a p-type doping. And a p-type doping is not going to be a p-n junction. We're not going to cause a, uh, a diode to be uh, created here. It's going to make a small a small con conductor or resistor over here. And then once we have this p-type, we can connect it to our, uh, our voltage source over here. And, uh, well, we're not going to connect it to our voltage source. We're going to connect it to the ground, of course, to give it um, our our ground voltage, which is going to go across the whole substrate. So this basically made an NMOS transistor. Okay, um, so that was how we made our NMOS transistor. Um, how do we make our PMOS transistor? So we can't go and stick a P-type um, into this side of the into this side of the substrate because, as we saw, P-type is not going to cause uh, a diode it's going to make a um, it's going to make a type of a resistor and if we stick a resistor and we give it any bias that's over ground it's going to cause a current that's going to run through the substrate so what we're going to do actually is we're going to take a whole area here and dope it with n type uh, with a light n type of a, uh, a dopant and we're going to call this an n well Okay, and now that we have an N well, this whole area became N. So what we can do is we can go over and we can um, uh, make our um, implants that are P type. So we can do P plus and P plus, and then we can have again uh, 
I made it green before. So we can put, build our gate on top of here. And on top of the gate, again, we can build another, uh, our gate oxide. We can build another um, uh, metal or, or semiconductor or, or polysilicon, uh, a highly uh, conductive semiconductor that can uh, be our gate terminal. And then we'll have our, maybe our, this is our D and this is our S and we get a PMOS over here. Okay, um, here again, we need on this side to uh, make sure that we don't have any diodes that are open. So let's draw the diodes over here. This is going to be very important to us. So here we get a diode that is from the um, substrate to the uh, end well. And um, we saw that this is already connected to ground. So what we need, and that's good. So what we need is that this end well will be. Um, connected to something that's higher than ground. And that won't be very hard because again, we don't have any um, voltages that are higher than ground, but we should make sure that it's not connected to, uh, that, that it can't float or something like that. And um, we have another diode over here that's connected between um, the uh, the uh, uh, diffusions over here and the end well. Well, now we can put these biased at anything, and we want to make sure these guys stay reverse biased. So the the way to do that is actually to put this end well at the highest voltage we can get, and the highest voltage that we usually have is our VDD. Um, so what we're going to do here now is put an N plus in here, which causes a again a conductive channel to the end well and this we're going to connect to our battery over there to our vdd um, so that's going to cause um, our our diodes here to from the diffusion to the end well to be reverse biased and our diodes from the substrate to the end well to be reverse biased um, so that's how we get our uh, our cmos transistors okay now we're going to see how we're going to build that and how we're going to actually make uh, different connections because for different connections what we're going to have to do then is come over and um, do things like uh, connect some sort of a uh, some sort of a uh, conductor to all these guys and to these guys right and then run all kinds of metals between them to connect them to each other and so forth okay so that we're going to see on the next slide and our next slide is basically the basic process flow. And we'll go over here kind of how this whole thing works. And then um, our next, our, the next section of our lecture will be detailing each and every one of these uh, types of uh, steps. So again, we start with this wafer, which again is lightly doped. It's our P uh, substrate. It's our lightly doped P type wafer. And what we're going to do now is we're going to um, grow something we call a field oxide or a FOX. Okay, the field oxide is a very thick oxide that's going to separate between transistors. In fact, what we're going to have here is this area over here is going to be an active area. And we're going to actually make an NMOS over here. And this area over here is going to be an active area. And we're going to make a PMOS over here. Okay, but these areas are just separations between them. And so we're going to separate them with these thick um, pieces of oxide that make sure that we don't have any currents from uh, side to side between the transistors and separate between them. Okay, then we're going to define our wells. So we want our PMOS over here. So what we have to do is put our N minus here and make this N well. Okay, usually we're going to also um, define a P well over here. Uh, the P well is again, not going to be a diode like this. This caused us to have a diode, right? This is not going to be a diode. It's going to be a, a resistive connection. But the reason we're going to have our P well over here is because that gives us um, more uh, uh, control over what the exact doping is in this small area. And that helps us to get our transistors to be more regular. Okay, the next thing is, and this is almost the secret of the CMOS process, is we're going to uh, grow the gate oxide um, on the whole wafer. So the gate oxide, that's what we uh, call T-ox, the thickness of the oxide. It's really small. It's a few nanometers. Okay, um, and this is a really important part. We can't have any defects inside this uh, gate oxide. We can't have any, um, any charge inside, or else it changes the VT of our transistor, the threshold voltage. Um, and it took a long time, many years, until they were able to get the process to be clean enough to actually be able to grow this gate oxide. And um, the secret of CMOS and the reason it took off in uh, like the late 70s and early 80s is because they were able to make the process good enough that... Um, we could get this really nice oxide here, really thin, uh, really controlled, really clean. Okay, and what we're doing here is, as you see, is we're, we're growing it on the whole wafer. On top of that, we're going to um, grow or deposit our gate material, which we usually call poly. 
um, poly because it used to be made out of polysilicon. Um, now we've gone back to a metal gate. In fact, the original MOSFETs were a metal oxide semiconductor. It was an aluminum gate. Now it's not an aluminum gate. It's a type of a metal gate. Uh, again, because of different things that happened in, um, recently, uh, which we'll discuss during the course. But um, what we're going to do is deposit this. And again, we deposited over the whole wafer. This is not as thin as the uh, as the gate oxide. And, it, and, and since it's just a conductor, it doesn't have to be as accurate. But Okay, why did we do this? Well, we're going to use something that's uh, used a lot in the process called self-alignment. In self-alignment, we, we're going to have our minimum feature of our um, transistor is going to be something really small. We're going to see today that it's much smaller than the w uh, wavelength of the light that we're going to use to cut it and to define it. Um, and one of the problems is each of these steps that we're doing uses different photo masks and different machines and so forth. And we have to align our wafer to, to be exact and accurate where our last one was. And if we have to define something that's 7 nanometers large and we make a mistake that's uh, plus minus 1 nanometer, that's going to be really, really bad. So if we can use self-alignment and not have to do in some sort of a very accurate alignment, um, with uh, then we're going to be in good shape. And in this case, since we put um, our uh, oxide and our gate oxide and then our gate material we have kind of like a uh, like a, a multi-layered cake we can just cut through it and we get this alignment accurate and we get this uh, l min of the transistor over here okay so we didn't have to go and align two pieces so that's a real important thing we call it self-alignment okay um, our next point is also a self-alignment um, now we want to go and we want to fill in our, um, our our diffusions. We have to put N plus over here and P plus over here. Well, guess what? We have this gate. We have this thick piece of polysilicon or, or metal that uh, will actually block if we bombard the, uh, the substrate with uh, ions. So we can just bombard it and we get our, our wells and they're nicely defined and, uh, and our dopants don't get stuck inside the channel, which is really good. So this is another self-alignment -align process. Once we did that, we have our transistors, and we can start building the connections to the transistors. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to build um, these black things are called contacts, okay? Um, contacts to the transistors, and around them we're going to have uh, a, a um, dielectric. Um, actually, it's a silicon dioxide, kind of like this is also. Um, and uh, it's going to be uh, separating between our contacts, and it's going to be separating between this bottom layer and the next layer that comes on top of it. We call it ILD, interlayer dielectric. Okay. Once we did that, we can go and we can put a metal layer on top of it. And so our metal layer, and this will, we're going to be calling metal one, um, that's going to be uh, uh, an aluminum or a copper layer that's going to be able to kind of make connections all around the chip. And then we can uh, cover that with uh, another interlayer dielectric, and we're going to put another contact. But this contact is going to be called VIA1. We're going to call it a VIA. And the, the contact that um, connects between the first metal layer and the second one is going to be called VIA1. And then we can make a second uh, metal layer. And we got something really cool over here without paying any attention. Basically, we got an NMOS over here. So let's draw it. This is an NMOS transistor. We got a PMOS over here, so let's draw it. That's a PMOS transistor. And look, uh, the gate of the NMOS is connected to the gate of the PMOS. Great. And the uh, drain of the NMOS and the drain of the PMOS are connected. That's good as well. Um, and finally, we can take this and uh, this over here and maybe connect it to uh, ground. Okay, and maybe this over here and connect it to VDD. And then we get VDD and we get ground. And what did we get? We got a uh, CMOS inverter. Okay, so um, actually we have the third dimension over here, which goes into the screen, which will help us make our, C uh, our, our um, transistors and our inverters and our gates and all of our systems. But uh, just in this even uh, cross section, we can see that we can make a CMOS inverter. So before uh, ending this section, I just wanted to go in, uh, back into the Computer Hall of Fame. And this week, what we have to talk about is actually the first integrated circuit computer. So it's not a very well-known computer. It's called the MOLECOM, which was a, a shorthand for a molecular electronic computer. And it was introduced in 1961 by Texas Instruments. Well, um, 
I want to ask you, is this a molecular computer? No. But it was so small relative to computers that they had up till then that they said it was like molecular. It was so small. Okay. Um, so uh, it's kind of interesting if you download the uh, data sheet for this thing, the marketing magazine that they were trying to sell it. It performs exactly the same functions as a conventional computer, but it's 150 times smaller and 48 times lighter. So you see some sort of computer in this mole con, which was much smaller. Um, but what they say is that it used three types of semiconductor networks. Now, what are semiconductor networks? I mean, we discuss networks nowadays. We're talking about the cloud and the internet and uh, big data centers and who knows what. What they were talking about is just a flip-flop, an OR gate, and logic drivers. Those were each called networks, okay? And they used eight to 16 of these networks of these basically gates that were welded together in a stack and a total of 47 stacks were made up the computer, okay? So each of these was a was a uh, integrated circuit and they had many of these, 587 of the integrated circuits were welded together to make the computer. So that's the first um, computer that was based on integrated circuits.